Now, can I swear on your show? <laughs> I think we're we're trying to move away from that. But okay. uh, oh, sorry, just, I just, just slid out. It's a PG thirteen broadcast. Folks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. That is okay. So that's amazing. Um, that, that your wife is a believer of sorts. I'm not. Yeah. I'm, I won't throw the label out. But well, you can. Um, I mean, she believes in she believes in God and heaven yeah. and um, those. I don't know if she believes in hell per se, but uh, but that is amazing. Okay, man. All right, hold the phone. Okay, and she supports you. I did. I see your wife at the American Atheist Convention. Yeah, she was there. She was there actually working the table with me. Yes, uh, the convention. I remember seeing that. I was set up. I think um, behind you over in the corner doing some interviews with some people, and. Um, so I've seen your wife. That is amazing. Yeah. That your and you know what's weird is, it, I mean, there, look, I'll, I'll, it's not, it's not all roses. I mean, there are times yeah. when I just want to, I'm sure she just wants to shake me and I just want to shake her. Like, do you <laughs> not see this? Right. And I'm very much an activist who I want to change the world, right? I'm a total crusader. So I'll see something stupid or crazy or insane or whatever on television. I'm like, this is the, this is apps i'll see something that the catholic church is doing you know and yeah, she'll yeah. just look at me like you cannot fix the whole world seth and i'm like yes yes i must go and i must fix the whole world and so <laughs> we're very we're, we're very different in that way and there are times when it's a struggle there are times when i th i think living with an activist is hard for her because it consumes me 24 7 it's something i'm i'm it's in my dna i want to i want to be a part of these discussions and it's hard for me sometimes because it would be nice if I had Natalie who could relate to my rejection of religion in yeah. all of its forms, pretty much almost all of its forms and, and get it not just, you know, logically and good for you. And I, I encourage you, but to sort of be able to be a cheerleader on my team with me, I do miss that sometimes. I mean, you sacrifice some stuff. But we decided that our lives were good enough that those things were, you know, we could live around those discrepancies and it's worked out. So. Well, that's amazing to hear. I mean, in so much as uh, you guys are partners and you go this direction and she goes this direction and you guys still manage a romance. To me, that's absolutely intriguing. But then again, you, you know, I sometimes think atheism or the atheism movement I gotta watch how I word this. Um, like we don't necessarily Christianity stands for a God and all the dogma that comes with what's attached to the dogma of coming from the Bible and Christianity and all that stuff. And then maybe we're over here saying, well, let's think about that for a little bit. So if I can characterize it just that way, if you do have a Christian over here that's just a cultural Christian, there's not much going on over there. And if you have an atheist over here who is recognizing that, then there's not much of a problem. Um, so that may or may not characterize um, your romance with your your wife or your relationship or any way. I think it, what makes us work. If she would look, if she was a fundamentalist Bible go to um, you know Sunday go to meet and Bible believing evangelical type, we'd never work. I'll admit that outright. Yeah. Yeah. If she was as much of a Christian as I am, an atheist activist. Uh, this would never have have worked. Okay, I mean, I, I I I have to be honest, but our values are we we share values. We both, you know, and which is the more important thing. We both love people. Mm. Uh, we both want, uh, you know, we both want good things. We we're both, uh, you know, we we both like to laugh. We both like to go to the movies. You know, those types of things. That, the, the living life stuff helps. Uh, you know, if that stuff doesn't line up, you got a real problem. Right. So, you know, if your values are, are shared values, then it becomes a lot easier. So. Seth, what about your children? Uh, and, and let me preface this. You have children, right? Uh, I have stepkids and oh, kids. animals myself, but uh, no kids gotcha. of my own. So. Well, um, here in the next couple of days, I'll be interviewing Joseph R. Becker, who is the author of the series, Annabelle and Aiden. Have you heard of that? Mm -mm, I have not. Look it up. It looks uh, it looks really interesting. Um, I can't wait to talk to him because these are children's books. Now your children are your stepchildren are likely grown, right? You said yeah. they're out of the house. Yeah. yeah. So I have a six year old. My youngest is six, and um, I cannot wait 
to read him these books because they're they're secularist by nature books. I don't want to speak too much on behalf of the author, but they're not religious books. They're not creationist books. And uh, an example is one of the titles to the book is What Happens When We Die? Wouldn't that be a great book to read to your son, you know, as your son is young, rather than perhaps feed them the indoctrination that were, were otherwise fed, you know, the thing that made you a Christian, the thing that made me climb a tree and, and ask for help some, somehow, you know, we, we can start the culture off yeah. a bit differently. What's your opinion on countering well, I, indoctrination with that? I, the difference I think between that, those types of books, I'm reminded of, uh, I forget the uh, David Smalley's publishing house, but they have the tiny thinkers books. Mm. Um, and they, um, they're, you know, they're wonderfully made. The difference is, is that those books are really about curiosity mm. where when I grew up with Christian books, it was always well, Noah built an ark. You know, it was just all these facts that we had to sort of, we, it was a story and we were intrigued by it, but it wasn't, there wasn't a lot of what if, yeah. what might be discovered tomorrow and what's out there and who knows and a lot of the books that i see coming out that are science-based books targeted to these young kids they are not dogmatic in that way they they will give facts uh, i had stayed um, in the home of some lovely people in ohio and um, uh, one of uh, one of them had authored a series of books for children about the sun and the moon and they were in the shape of the sun and the moon and like the moon book, you open it up and it has the different phases. I think there are eight, eight or nine phases of the moon. And it would have, it would have a big illustration showing how much of the moon was in shadow. What do you call it? What does it mean? So, I mean, there are facts in science books, but mm. beyond that, it's not believe this, but we can't ever show it to you or you can't ever prove it in the real world or yeah. believe it or you're going to go to hell. There's none of that kind of stuff, even implied, which young children's books imply judgment for, for rejection. The uh, secular children's books are really more like, uh, I've, here's a great example. It's not even a children's book, really. I've got a coffee table book downstairs called uh, What Do You Do With an Idea? Mm. And the idea is pictured with this little illustration, this little body of, of something. It's really cute. And there's a little boy looking at the idea and the coffee table book is just one of these little flip books that, you know, you, you encourage it and you nurture the idea and you let the idea roam and you, you know, you, you, uh, you follow the idea to see where it might lead you. And it's a great way of not spoon feeding answers per se, but to encourage little scientists to be scientists in their world. And that's, that's, I think, the, the difference. We, we can all be scientists. Science is a process of understanding our world. And kids are great scientists when they are not inhibited by dogmatic thinking and religious institutions. Remain yeah. curious. When I sign books for kids, teenagers, you know, young teenagers, I will sign a book and says, make every day a discovery. Stay yeah. curious. Because when we stop being curious, that's when we let everybody else do all the thinking for us. So I'm encouraged by those texts and those uh, children's books that have secular and science themes. A couple of quick fire questions, and then we'll move on to something slightly different. Nick Thomas is asking in the live feed of platforms like this, help make atheism um, less taboo or topics like what we're discussing less taboo. What do you think? I think, yeah, the more, the more it's out there. I mean, look, I'm an atheist. More important than being an atheist to me, which describes what I don't believe in, is I'm a humanist, right? I, yeah. Um, that's what I do believe in, Yeah, is bettering the human condition. Um, but I like using the word atheist because I think it's the more we use it, the more it's normalized. The more we say, I'm deconverted instead of converted, the more it's normalized. And I think the more culturally normal you make it, the less people flip out about it. The harder it is to misrepresent it, yeah, I do think the shows like this and and anytime we can talk about living deity free, loud and proud, I think that helps everyone. Joshua M over on the live feed is asking, do you ever feel any resentment for um, those who fed us mm -hmm. religious 
doctrine. I, you know, do I, with that? I've had resentment. It's, I don't. I never resented my mother and father for teaching us that the Bible is true, because I, I, there was a sincere desire to be a good parent. And both of my parents, I'm convinced, would would die for any of their children. They, they, their love was never in question. They sacrificed so much for us. And in my book, Deconverted, I remember in the uh, in the first or in the introduction, I think I, I had to say immediately, you know, if my family's going to come up occasionally, but you need to know that uh, we were always raised and surrounded by love and, and sincerity. Uh, I just think they're victims of bad ideas, you know? Um, so I don't have any resentment about that. Uh, my resentment came after when I was a man in his late thirties who was saying, you know, I don't buy it. Mm -hmm. And then when I started the website and the radio podcast and they're yelling, you know, you're embarrassing the family and why can't you just keep quiet? And yeah, and they don't, everyone else at the uh, family gatherings gets asked what they did for a living or how work is going, except for me, nobody asked me, um, this double standard, the, the guilt and the shame and, and this weird narrative that parents often use on even very grown children that because we are your mother and father, we have a say in how you live. Um, that is something that I think has to be stood against. I'm not 12, for Pete's mm -hmm. sake. You know, uh, when does someone come to the point in their life when they get to live their life on their terms, to pursue truth on their terms? And so this weird overstepping of boundaries that eventually resulted in the blocking of my mother and father, um, that was sort of this this belief that, well, this is not how we raised you. And I'm not a clone. I was raised in as a, a child to become a free thinking adult who had a personality of his own, who has hopes and dreams, who has processes for reasoning of his own. My life, I'm thankful for the sacrifices they made, but they don't get to dictate. And I would encourage any of your viewers or listeners the very same. If you have someone in your family who's playing the family card, and they're like, well, we have this expectation that you will carry our mantle, you will vote like us, you will live like us, you mm. will love like us, you will worship like us. You have every right to say, I'm not you. I'm mm. my own person. And you don't have to like it. You don't have to even support it. But you will respect my right to live my life. And if they refuse to respect your right to live your own life, you have every right to shut the door. It's unfortunate, but sometimes it's necessary. And it's my hope that one day the door will crack back open with mom and dad and we'll be able to have some kind of a relationship. But for right now, the boundaries have been pretty, pretty uh, solidly drawn. Did I hear you correctly at the American Atheist Convention uh, that you said you're writing a book, something with ghost <laughs> stories? Am I, am I wrong yeah. on this? Yeah, it's weird because people who on the surface hear that an atheist activist is a fan of ghost stories, they're like, uh, <laughs> wait, isn't that spirits? And I always have to just stop and go, just hang on. Uh, <laughs> but I've always been a fan of the horror genre, not blood, gore, but uh, but a good ghost story, yeah. uh, whether it's film, literature. And I'm a big fan and because I'm a broadcaster of the old time radio plays. And so in October... Uh, I don't know how many years ago, seven, eight years ago on the radio podcast, just as a distraction, I started doing a Halloween broadcast mm. and we'd sit around the virtual campfire and we'd tell ghost stories and it grew and it grew every year became its own thing. And five years ago, I started climaxing the show with an original story. Yeah. And I mean, before I knew it, I was spending hundreds, this is not an exaggeration, hundreds of hours in the production room, putting together these extremely ornate and in intricate pieces with, uh, you know, I don't know how many different clips, hundreds of clips, all meticulously arranged every turn of a doorknob, every music cue, every breath, every footstep had to be imagined and, and produced. Yeah. And finally I decided after all of the time I've spent on this for the radio to get serious about producing it for an audio book, which will be my third audio book. And so ghost stories, original tales and ghostly urban legends is pretty much done. And the audible.com book should hit late September. 
and it'll have 14 stories. There are some echoes of a few broadcasts that we've done before. I included a couple of old stories. I've reinvented a few old stories. There's a bunch of new material. I brought actors in, uh, some great voice talents, and uh, just really mixed it up. And I, I've got a few goals. One is a distraction because you can only talk about atheism so long. And after a while, you can only say there's no evidence for any gods anywhere so many times. And after a while, you need a break. The second thing is I'm hoping it'll provide another revenue stream because I am self-employed as an activist. And the third thing is, and this is big, I'm hoping that it will, in the month of October, really sort of get into a position where it can be seen by people who have no idea who Seth Andrews is. Mm -hmm. And they will then sort of drift into these other conversations we're having about religion and belief and goodness and morality. And before you know it, they're engaging on a level they never intended. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, if anybody asks why an atheist activist loves ghost stories, I'll ask them why they love Harry Potter or Star Wars or Lord of the Rings. These, this is the cultivation of imagination. This is the imagination at work. It is just fun fiction, a nice distraction. And so the book ought to be out here in September on audible.com. Awesome. <laughs> um, I'll make sure to link to it. I think I put your link up on fullydeconverted.com on our learn page. Um, Thank you. It'll be at uh, sethandrews.net when it releases. I'll have a direct link on the homepage. There's nothing there now, but uh, when it comes out, I'll make sure everybody can find it. Absolutely. Where can people find you, Seth? Uh, the thinkingatheist.com is the main hub for the material that I produce. Again, I'm not the thinking atheist, but uh, you can find the work podcasts come out every Tuesday. Those are listed. The patrons get them early. I've got videos that I produce, interviews in short form, vignettes and speeches and other stuff. Uh, all that's available at the thinkingatheist.com. And if you're curious about me personally, you want to see Henry and Rat Dog and photos and videos from the pets and all that stuff, you can go to sethandrews.net. Awesome. All right, everybody online, I'm looking at you right now. Go ahead and give me as many likes on this video as I'm seeing live right now to support content like this, to support Seth Andrews, to support Fully Deconverted, and uh, so we can keep bringing you great content. I will post links that I do not have already to Seth in the description so look for those after the live feed in the playlist to make sure you can find out as much about him as you like that is it everybody thank you for joining fully deconverted for this live interview with seth andrews of the thinking atheist seth say bye hey it's been a pleasure thanks so much